in a galaxy far away, far beyond our own, where all dogs love comic books. One pack of space dogs stands out, head and tail above all others. The Super Fan Dogs. On a mighty mission to sniff out fantastic facts about the best comic books and comic book heroes in the universe. Oh, my doggy senses are tingling, Skyfetcher. Uh, is somebody talking about us? Space lover, Skyfetcher! Yes, yes sir, sir, Captain, Captain Fuzzface! Welcome once more to the Super Dogs headquarters. You've been fetched for another mission of utmost importance. Great, Captain Fuzzface. Oh, we love missions of utmost importance. As you would, team. As super fan dogs, your duty is to chase and retrieve the most amazing facts about comics. Yes! Comics are our bread and uh, kibble, Captain Fuzzface. <laughs> then collect your teams, get your wagging tails to the super fan ship, and get yourselves flying. All, All right. right. Dr. Tailwag will bring you on your mission once you are spacebound. Dog speed, super dogs. You guys, I'm so excited. I can barely stay in my fur. What do you think our mission's going to be this time? Facts, knowledge, fandom, and fun for starters. Well, that's for sure. We have the best job in the galaxy. Super fan dogs forever. Super, Super fan, fan dogs, dogs forever, forever and a light, light year. year. Ready for our next mission, everybody? Flashback Eugenia, the pup with the greatest memory retention in the galaxy. Ready. Tongue twist tough nut, the smartest canine in the universe. Ready. Oh, uh, I'm just space lobber, you guys, uh, but I'm ready too. Awesome. I'm patching us through to Dr. Tailwig. Ah, super fan dogs. Can you guess what our next super fan topic is going to be? What? Aha! You'll love this, pups. Regardless of your age, everyone needs a hero to look up to. Likewise, every hero needs a villain. One great man has given the world more than its fair share of both. That man? Comic book icon Stan Lee. His long career has been just as legendary as the incredible characters he created and elevated to unbelievable levels of stardom. Let's take a look at this real-life superhero's journey. Stan Lee was an American comic book writer, editor, publisher, and producer. He rose through the ranks of a family-run business to become Marvel Comics' primary creative leader for two decades leading its expansion from a small division of a publishing house to a multimedia corporation that dominated the comics industry. In collaboration with others at Marvel, particularly co-writer and artist Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, he co-created numerous popular fictional characters, including superheroes Spider-Man, the X-Men, Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk, the Fantastic Four, Black Panther, Daredevil, Doctor Strange, Scarlet Witch, and Ant-Man. In doing so, he pioneered a more naturalistic approach to writing superhero comics in the 1960s, and in the 1970s he challenged the restrictions of the comics code of authority, indirectly leading to changes in its policies. In the 1980s he pursued development of Marvel properties and other media, with mixed results. Following his retirement from Marvel in the 1990s, he remained a public figurehead for the company and frequently made cameo appearances in films and television shows based on Marvel characters, on which he received an executive producer credit. Meanwhile, he continued independent creative ventures into his 90s until his death in 2018. Lee was inducted into the comic book industry's Will Eisner Award Hall of Fame in 1994 and the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame in 1995. He received the National Endowment for the Arts National Medal of Arts in 2008. Born Stanley Martin Lieber on December 28, 1922 in Manhattan, New York City, in the apartment of his Romanian-born Jewish immigrant parents Celia and Jack Lieber, at the corner of West 98th Street and West End Avenue in Manhattan. Though raised in a Jewish household, in a 2002 interview, he stated when asked if he believes in God, 
Well, let me put it this way. No, I'm not going to try to be clever. I really don't know. I just don't know. His father, trained as a dress cutter, worked only sporadically after the Great Depression, and the family moved further uptown to Fort Washington Avenue in Washington Heights, Manhattan. Lee had one younger brother named Larry Lieber. He said in 2006 that as a child he was influenced by books and movies, particularly those with Errol Flynn playing heroic roles. By the time Lee was in his teens, the family was living in an apartment at 1720 University Avenue in the Bronx. Lee described it as a third floor apartment facing out back. Lee and his brother shared a bedroom, while their parents slept on a fold out couch. Lee attended DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. In his youth, Lee enjoyed writing and entertained dreams of writing the great American novel one day. He said that in his youth, he worked such part-time jobs as writing obituaries for a news service and press releases for the National Tuberculosis Center, delivering sandwiches for the Jack Murray Pharmacy to offices in Rockefeller Center, working as an office boy for a trouser manufacturer, ushering at the Rivoli Theater on Broadway, and selling subscriptions to the New York Herald Tribune newspaper. Wow! Mind blown! Yeah! I thought I was the most super of all super fan dogs, but I never knew all that. A lesson's only just begun. We have lots more to learn. Let's get to it. If my tail wags any harder, I might propel myself out of this spaceship and into outer space. Haha, <laughs> well, we don't want you to get lost in space before you're deployed to your next super fan mission. Let's get to the facts, shall we? At 15, Lee entered a high school essay competition sponsored by the New York Herald Tribune called the Biggest News of the Week Contest. Lee claimed to have won the prize for three straight weeks, goading the newspaper to write him and asking him to let someone else win. The paper suggested he look into writing professionally, which Lee claimed probably changed my life. He graduated from high school early, age 16 and a half, in 1939, he joined the Works Progress Administration Federal Theater Project. From 1945 to 1947, Lee lived in the rented top floor of a brownstone in the East 90s in Manhattan. He married Joan Clayton Bucock, originally from Newcastle, England, on December 5, 1947, and in 1949, the couple bought a house in Woodmere, New York on Long Island, living there through 1952. Their daughter, Joan Celia J.C. Lee, was born in 1950. Another daughter, Jan Lee, died three days after delivery in 1953. The Lees resided in the Long Island town of Hewitt Harbor, New York from 1952 to 1980. They also owned a condominium on East 63rd Street in Manhattan from 1975 to 1980 and during the 1970s owned a vacation home in Remensburg, New York. For their move to the West Coast in 1981, they bought a home in West Hollywood, California, previously owned by comedian Jack Benny's radio announcer Don Wilson. Lee believed in giving back all that he could in the best and most helpful ways possible. The Stan Lee Foundation was founded in 2010 to focus on literacy, education, and the arts. It is stated goals include supporting programs and ideas that improve access to literacy resources, as well as promoting diversity, national literacy, culture, and the arts. So how did he become an icon as equally popular as characters like the Amazing Spider-Man? For that answer, we need to go way back to the beginnings of his career in publishing. With the help of his uncle Robbie Solomon, Lee became an assistant in 1939 at the new Timely Comics division of Pulp Magazine and comic book publisher Martin Goodman's company. Timely, by the 1960s, would evolve into Marvel Comics. Lee, whose cousin Jean was Goodman's wife, was formally hired by Timely editor Joe Simon. His duties were prosaic at first. In those days, the artist dipped the pen in ink, so I had to make sure the inkwells were filled, Lee recalled of his humble beginnings during a 2009 interview. I went down and got them their lunch. I did proofreading. I erased the pencils from the finished pages for them. Marshalling his childhood ambition to be a writer, young Stanley Lieber made his comic book debut with the text filler 
Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge in May of 1941's issue of Captain America Comics No. 3, using the pseudonym Stan Lee, a play on his first name, Stanley, which years later he would adopt as his legal name. Lee later explained in his autobiography and numerous other sources that because of the low social status of comic books, he was so embarrassed that he used a pen name so that nobody would associate his real name with comics when he someday wrote the great American novel. This initial story also introduced Captain America's trademark ricocheting shield toss. He graduated from writing filler to actual comics with a backup feature. Headline Hunter, Foreign Correspondent, two issues later. Lee's first superhero co-creation was The Destroyer in August of 1941's Mystic Comics No. 6. Other characters he co-created during this period fans and historians call the Golden Age of Comic Books include Jack Frost, debuting in August of 1941's USA Comics No. 1, August 1941, and Father Time, who debuted in August 1941's Captain America Comics No. 6. When Simon and his creative partner Jack Kirby left late in 1941, following a dispute with Goodman, the 30-year-old publisher installed Lee, just under 19 years old, as interim editor. The youngster showed a knack for the business that led him to remain as the comic book division's editor-in-chief, as well as art director for much of that time, until 1972 when he would succeed Goodman as publisher. Even though Lee spent his time making people happy across the country, the time eventually came for him to serve his country. Lee entered the United States Army in early 1942 and served within the U.S. as a member of the Signal Corps, repairing telegraph poles and other communications equipment during World War II. He was later transferred to the Training Film Division, where he worked writing manuals, training films, slogans, and occasionally cartooning. His military classification, he said, was playwright. He added that only nine men in the U.S. Army were given that title. In the Army, Lee's division included many famous or soon-to-be-famous people, including three-time Academy Award-winning director Frank Capra, New Yorker cartoonist Charles Adams, who created The Adams Family, and children's book writer and illustrator Theodore Geisel, later known to the world as Dr. Seuss. Vincent Fago, editor of Timely's Animation Comics section, which put out humor and funny animal comics, filled in until Lee returned from his World War II military service in 1945. Lee was inducted into the Signal Corps Regiment Association and was given honorary membership of the 2nd Battalion of 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment out of Joint Base Lewis McCord at the 2017 Emerald City Comic Con for his prior service. Whoa! Tons of incredible facts about totally amazing stuff! I can feel my brains expanding to dinosaur bone proportions! I think I'm ready for our mission, Dr. Tailwag! Let's go! Hold on, Tough Nut! Hold on! Not so fast! We still have lots to go over! And all of it requires your utmost attention for your mission to be successful! Begging for knowledge, Dr. Tailwag! Wagging for facts! We're ready to proceed when you are, Dr. Tailwig. Nibble and chew bones. Super fan facts are my favorite thing in the universe. Right. I could dig up these tidbits all day long. Well, luckily for you, I have many more to share, Eugenia, like this one. While in the army, Lee received letters every week on Friday from the editors at Timely, detailing what they needed written and by when. Lee would write and then send back the story on Monday. One week, the mail clerk overlooked his letter, explaining nothing was in Lee's mailbox. The next day, however, Lee went by the closed mailroom and saw an envelope with the return address of Timely Comics in his mailbox. Not willing to miss a deadline, Lee asked the officer in charge to open the mailroom, but he refused. So Lee took a screwdriver and unscrewed the mailbox hinges, enabling him to get at the assignment. The mailroom officer saw what he did and turned him in to the base captain, who did not like Lee. He faced tampering charges and could have been sent to Leavenworth Prison. Luckily, the colonel in charge of the finance department intervened and saved Lee from disciplinary action. 
In the mid-1950s, by which the company was now generally known as Atlas Comics, Lee wrote stories in a variety of genres including romance, westerns, humor, science fiction, medieval adventure, horror, and suspense. In the 1950s, Lee teamed up with his comic book colleague Dan DiCarlo to produce the syndicated newspaper strip My Friend Irma, based on the radio comedy starring Marie Wilson. By the end of the decade, Lee had become dissatisfied with his career and considered quitting the field. In the late 1950s, DC Comics editor Julius Schwartz revived the superhero archetype and experienced a significant success with its updated version of The Flash, and later with Super Team The Justice League of America. In response, publisher Martin Goodman assigned Lee to come up with a new superhero team. Lee's wife suggested that he experiment with stories he preferred, since he was planning on changing careers and had nothing to lose. Lee acted on that advice, giving his superheroes a flawed humanity, a change from the ideal archetypes that were typically written for preteens. Before this, most superheroes were idealistically perfect people with no serious lasting problems. Lee introduced complex, naturalistic characters who could have bad tempers, fits of melancholy, and vanity. They bickered amongst themselves, worried about paying their bills and impressing girlfriends, got bored, or were even sometimes physically ill. The first superheroes Lee and artist Jack Kirby created together were the Fantastic Four, based on a previous Kirby superhero team, Challengers of the Unknown, published by DC Comics. The team's immediate popularity led Lee and Marvel's illustrators to produce a cavalcade of new titles. Again working with Kirby, Lee co-created The Hulk, Thor, Iron Man, and The X-Men, with Bill Everett, Daredevil, and with Steve Ditko, Doctor Strange, and Marvel's most successful character, Spider-Man, all of whom lived in a thoroughly shared universe. Lee and Kirby gathered several of their newly created characters together into the team titled The Avengers, and would revive characters from the 1940s such as the Submariner and Captain America. Years later, Kirby and Lee would contest who deserved credit for creating the Fantastic Four. According to comics historian Peter Sanderson, during the 1960s DC was the equivalent of the big Hollywood studios. After the brilliance of DC's reinvention of the superhero in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it had run into a creative drought by the decade's end. There was a new audience for comics now, and it wasn't just the little kids that traditionally had read the books. The Marvel of the 1960s was in its own way the counterpart of the French New Wave. Marvel was pioneering new methods of comic storytelling and characterization, addressing more serious themes, and in the process keeping and attracting readers in their teens and beyond. Moreover, among this new generation of readers were people who wanted to write or draw comics themselves within the new style that Marvel had pioneered and pushed the creative envelope still further. Lee's revolution extended beyond the characters and storylines to the way in which comic books engaged the readership and built a sense of community between fans and creators. He introduced the practice of regularly including a credit panel on the splash page of each story, naming not just the writer and penciler, but also the inker and letterer. Regular news about Marvel staff members and upcoming storylines was presented on the bullpen bulletins page which, like the letter columns that appeared in each title, was written in a friendly, chatty style. Lee remarked that his goal was for fans to think of the comics creators as friends, and considered it a mark of his success on this front that, at a time when letters to other comics publishers were typically addressed Dear Editor, letters to Marvel addressed the creators by their first names. Lee recorded messages to the newly formed Mary Marvel Marching Society fan club in 1965. By 1967, the brand was well enough ensconced in popular culture that a March 3rd WBAI radio program with Lee and Kirby as guests was titled Will Success Spoil Spider-Man? Throughout the 1960s, Lee scripted, art directed, and edited most of Marvel's series, moderated the letters pages, wrote a monthly column called Stan's Soapbox, 
and wrote endless promotional copy, often signing off with his trademark motto, Excelsior, which also happens to be New York State's motto. To maintain his workload and meet deadlines, he used a system that was used previously by various comic book studios, but due to Lee's success with it, became known as the Marvel Method. Typically, Lee would brainstorm a story with the artist and then prepare a brief synopsis rather than a full script. Based on the synopsis, the artist would fill the allotted number of pages by determining and drawing the panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. After the artist turned in penciled pages, Lee would write the word balloons and captions and then oversee the lettering and coloring. In effect, the artists were co-plotters whose collaborative first drafts Lee built upon. Following Ditko's departure from Marvel in 1966, John Romita Sr. became Lee's collaborator on The Amazing Spider-Man. Within a year, it overtook Fantastic Four to become the company's top seller. Lee and Romita's stories focused as much on the social and college lives of the characters as they did on Spider-Man's adventures. The stories became more topical, addressing issues such as the Vietnam War, political elections, and student activism. Robbie Robertson, introduced in The Amazing Spider-Man No. 51 in August of 1967, was one of the first African-American characters in comics to play a serious supporting role. In the Fantastic Four series, the lengthy run by Lee and Kirby produced many acclaimed storylines, as well as characters that have become central to Marvel, including the Inhumans and the Black Panther an African king who would be mainstream comics' first black superhero. The story frequently cited as Lee and Kirby's finest achievement is the three-part Galactus trilogy that began in March of 1966's Fantastic Four No. 48, chronicling the arrival of Galactus, a cosmic giant who wanted to devour the planet, and his herald, the Silver Surfer. Fantastic Four No. 48 was chosen as number 24 in the 100 Greatest Marvels of All Time poll of Marvel's readers in 2001. Editor Robert Greenberger wrote in his introduction to the story that as the fourth year of the Fantastic Four came to a close, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby seemed to be only warming up. In retrospect, it was perhaps the most fertile period of any monthly title during the Marvel Age. Comics historian Les Daniels noted that the mystical and metaphysical elements that took over the saga were perfectly suited to the tastes of young readers in the 1960s, and Lee soon discovered that the story was a favorite on college campuses. Lee and artist John Buscema launched the Silver Surfer series in August of 1968. The following year, Lee and Gene Colan created The Falcon, comics' first African-American superhero in September of 1969's Captain America No. 117. Then in 1971, Lee indirectly helped reform the comics code. The U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare had asked Lee to write a comic book story about the dangers of drugs, and Lee conceived a three-issue subplot in The Amazing Spider-Man No. 96-98 published from May to July of 1971, in which Peter Parker's best friend becomes addicted to prescription drugs. The Comics Code Authority refused to grant its seal because the stories depicted drug use. The anti-drug context was considered irrelevant. With Goodman's cooperation and confident that the original government request would give him credibility, Lee had the story published without seal. The comics sold well, and Marvel won praise for its socially conscious efforts. The CCA subsequently loosened the code to permit negative depictions of drugs, among other new freedoms. Lee also supported using comic books to provide some measure of social commentary about the real world, often dealing with racism and bigotry. Stan's Soapbox, besides promoting an upcoming comic book project, also addressed issues of discrimination, intolerance, or prejudice. In 1972, Lee stopped writing monthly comic books to assume the role of publisher. His final issue of The Amazing Spider-Man was July of 1972's issue number 110, and his last Fantastic Four was August of 1972's issue number 125. It was during this time in which Lee became a figurehead and public face for Marvel Comics. 
He made appearances at comic book conventions around America, lecturing at colleges and participating in panel discussions. Lee and John Romita Sr. launched the Spider-Man newspaper comic strip on January 3rd, 1977. Lee's final collaboration with Jack Kirby, The Silver Surfer, The Ultimate Cosmic Experience, was published in 1978 as part of Comics Fireside Books series and is considered to be Marvel's first graphic novel. Lee and John Buscema produced the first issue of The Savage She-Hulk, released in February 1980, which introduced the female cousin of the Hulk and crafted a Silver Surfer story for spring 1980's Epic Illustrated No. 1. Lee moved to California in 1981 to develop Marvel's TV and movie properties. He was an executive producer for and made cameo appearances in Marvel film adaptations and other movies. He occasionally returned to comic book writing with various Silver Surfer projects including a 1982 one-shot drawn by John Burney, the Judgment Day graphic novel illustrated by John Buscema, the Parable Limited series drawn by French artist Mobius and the Enslavers graphic novel with Keith Pollard. Lee was briefly president of the entire company, but soon stepped down to become publisher instead, finding that being president was too much about numbers and finance, and not enough about the creative process he enjoyed. Lee stepped away from regular duties at Marvel in the 1990s, though he continued to receive an annual salary of $1 million as Chairman Emeritus. In 1998, he and Peter Paul began a new internet-based superhero creation, production, and marketing studio, Stan Lee Media. It grew to 165 people and went public through a reverse merger structured by investment banker Stan Medley in 1999. But near the end of 2000, investigators discovered illegal stock manipulation by Paul and corporate officer Stephen Gordon. Stan Lee Media filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in February 2001. Paul was extradited to the US from Brazil and pled guilty to violating SEC Rule 10b-5 in connection with trading of his stocks in Stan Lee Media. Lee was never implicated in the scheme. In 2001, Lee, Gil Champion, and Arthur Lieberman formed POW, Purveyors of Wonder entertainment to develop film, television, and video game properties. Lee created the risque animated superhero series Stripperella for Spike TV. What a bacon strip! Super fan training is the best thing since they invented frisbees. That's the idea, Sky. Get your super fan dog's brain stuffed with knowledge so your next mission can proceed as smooth as a well-greased mutton chops down your gullet. Yum! That's the way I like my mutton chops! That's the way I like my facts! You only have one chance to get each of your missions right, team! Failure cannot be in your fortune biscuit! Failure? Never! Super fan dogs complete each mission without failure! All missions are different, Tough Nut! And with each mission, new sets of perils dwell, and new kinds of obstacles await! V is right, team! We can't ever be too prepared! Let's keep our ears perked, pups. The super fan dogs must be ready for anything. That's the spirit, Eugenia. Following the success of Fox Studios' 2000 X-Men film and Sony's then-current Spider-Man film, Lee sued Marvel in 2002, claiming that the company was failing to pay his share of the profits from movies featuring the characters he had co-created. Because he had done so as an employee, Lee did not own them. But in the 1990s, after decades of making little money licensing them for television and film, Marvel had promised him 10% of any future profits. Lee and the company settled in 2005 for an undisclosed seven-figure amount. In 2004, POW Entertainment went public through a reverse merger again structured by investment banker Stan Medley. Also that year, Lee announced a superhero program that would feature former Beatle Ringo Starr as the lead character. Additionally, in August of that year, Lee announced the launch of Stan Lee's Sunday Comics, a short-lived subscription service hosted by ComicWorks.com. From July 2006 until September 2007, Lee hosted, co-created, executive produced, and judged the reality television game show competition Who Wants to Be a Superhero on the Sci-Fi Channel. 
In March 2007, after Stan Lee Media had been purchased by Jim Nesfield, the company filed a lawsuit against Marvel Entertainment for $5 billion, claiming Lee had given his rights to several Marvel characters to Stan Lee Media in exchange for stock and salary. In June 2007, Stan Lee Media sued Lee, his newer company, POW Entertainment, and POW subsidiary QED Entertainment. In 2008, Lee wrote humorous captions for the political fumetti book Stan Lee Presents Election Days. What are they really saying? In April of that year, Brighton Partners and Rainmaker Animation announced a partnership with POW to produce a CGI film series, Legion of Five. Other projects by Lee announced in the late 2000s included a line of superhero comics for Virgin Comics, a TV adaptation of the novel Hero, a forward to Skyscraper Man by Skyscraper fire safety advocate and Spider-Man fan Dan Goodwin, a partnership with Guardian Media Entertainment and The Guardian Project to create NHL superhero mascots and work with the Eagle Initiative program to find new talent in the comic book field. In October 2011, Lee announced he would partner with 1821 Comics on a multimedia imprint for children, Stan Lee's Kids Universe, a move he said addressed the lack of comic books targeted for that demographic and that he was collaborating with the company on its futuristic graphic novel Romeo and Juliet The War by writer Max Work and artist Scan Srisuan. At the 2012 San Diego Comic Con International, Lee announced his YouTube channel, Stan Lee's World of Heroes, which airs programs created by Lee, Mark Hamill, Peter David, Adrian Curry, and Bonnie Burton, among others. Lee wrote the book Zodiac, released in January 2015 with Stuart Moore. The film Stan Lee's Annihilator, based on a Chinese prisoner turned superhero named Ming and in production since 2013, was released in 2015. In his later career, Lee's contributions continued to expand outside the style that he helped pioneer. An example of this is his first work for DC Comics in the 2000s, launching the Just Imagine series in which Lee reimagined the DC superheroes Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and The Flash. Manga projects involving Lee include Kara Curry Doji Ultimo, a collaboration with Hiroyuki Takei, Viz Media and Shuisha, and Hero Man, serialized in Square Enix's monthly Shonen Gangan with the Japanese company Bones. In 2011, Lee started writing a live-action musical, The Yin and Yang Battle of Tao. This period also saw a number of collaborators honor Lee for his influence on the comics industry. In 2006, Marvel commemorated Lee's 65 years with the company by publishing a series of one-shot comics starring Lee himself, meeting and interacting with many of his co-creations, including Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, The Thing, Silver Surfer, and Doctor Doom. These comics also feature short pieces by such comics creators as Joss Whedon and Fred Hembeck, as well as reprints of classic Lee-written adventures. At the 2007 Comic-Con International, Marvel Legends introduced a Stan Lee action figure. The body beneath the figure's removable cloth wardrobe is a reused mold of a previously released Spider-Man action figure with minor changes. Kamikaze Expo Los Angeles's largest comic book convention was rebranded as Stan Lee's Kamikaze, presented by POW Entertainment in 2012. At the 2016 Comic-Con International, Lee introduced his digital graphic novel Stan Lee's God Woke, with text originally written as a poem he presented at Carnegie Hall in 1972. The print book version won the 2017 Independent Publisher Book Awards Outstanding Books of the Year Independent Voice Award. There's no doubt about it. Lee had done enough in his career to conquer the comic book industry, but in typical Lee fashion, a hero's work is never done. The Marvel Cinematic Universe MCU, is an American media franchise and shared universe center on a series of superhero films independently produced by Marvel Studios and based on characters that appear in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. The franchise also includes comic books, short films, 
television series and digital series. The shared universe, much like the original Marvel Universe in comic books, was established by crossing over common plot elements, settings, cast, and characters. The first MCU film was Iron Man, 2008, which began the first phase of films culminating in the crossover film The Avengers, 2012. Phase 2 began with Iron Man 3, 2013, and concluded with Ant-Man, 2015. Phase 3 began with Captain America Civil War 2016 and concluded with Spider-Man Far From Home 2019. The first three phases in the franchise are collectively known as the Infinity Saga. The new Saga, along with the beginning of Phase 4, will begin with the upcoming film Black Widow in 2020, which will be a prequel and the first solo film for the character. Marvel Television expanded the universe to network television with Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on ABC in the 2013-14 television season, followed by online streaming with Marvel's Daredevil on Netflix in 2015 and Marvel's Runaways on Hulu in 2017, and then to cable television with Marvel's Cloak and Dagger on Freeform in 2018. Whoa! That was super interesting! My canine brain is itching for more! How are we doing so far, Dr. Tailwig? I'm very pleased with how you are faring, team. I was worried the mission was too dangerous for you four, but I'm happy to say, I believe you all have what it takes to accomplish a successful high-stakes mission. We do? All right! Super fan dogs are the best! Oh, uh, I second that! I third that, you guys! I'm so thrilled! I might just need to spend 30 minutes in my dog vest just to decompress, Captain Dr. Tailwig. Now, now, let's not get too excited quite yet. There's still so much to cover. Next, let's check out some more incredible stats. Marvel Television also produced the digital series Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Slingshot. Soundtrack albums have been released for all the films and many of the television series, as well as compilation albums containing existing music heard in the films. The MCU also includes tie-in comics published by Marvel Comics, while Marvel Studios has also produced a series of direct-to-video short films and a viral marketing campaign for its films and the universe with the faux news program WHIH Newsfront. The franchise has been commercially successful and has generally received a positive critical response, though some reviewers have found that some of its films and television series have suffered in service of the wider universe. It has inspired other film and television studios with comic book character adaptation rights to attempt to create similar shared universes. The MCU has also been the focus of other media outside of the shared universe, including attractions at various Walt Disney parks and resorts, an attraction at Discovery Times Square, a Queensland Gallery of Modern Art exhibit, two television specials, guidebooks for each film, multiple tie-in video games, and commercials. Filmmakers Avi Arad and Kevin Feige's vision for the MCU is second only to Lee's overall vision. Feige was Arad's second in command, and he realized that unlike Spider-Man and the X-Men, whose film rights were licensed to Sony and Fox respectively, Marvel still owned the rights to the core members of the Avengers. Feige, a self-professed fanboy, envisioned creating a shared universe just as creators Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had done with their comic books in the early 1960s. To raise capital, the studio secured funding from a seven-year, $525 million revolving credit facility with Merrill Lynch. Marvel's plan was to release individual films for their main characters and then merge them in a crossover film. Arad, who doubted the strategy, yet insisted that it was his reputation that helped secure the initial financing, resigned the following year. In 2007, at 33 years old, Feige was named Studio Chief. In order to preserve its artistic integrity, Marvel Studios formed a creative committee of six people familiar with its comic book lore. Feige, Marvel Studios co-president Louis Desposito, Marvel Comics president of publishing Dan Buckley, Marvel's Chief Creative Officer Joe Quesada, writer Brian Michael Bendis, and Marvel Entertainment President Alan Fine, who oversaw the committee. 
Feige initially referred to the shared narrative continuity of these films as the Marvel Cinema Universe, but later used the term Marvel Cinematic Universe. Since the franchise expanded to other media, this phrase has been used by some to refer to the feature films only. Marvel designated the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Earth-199999, within the continuity of the company's comic multiverse, a collection of fictional alternate universes. In November 2013, Feige said that in an ideal world, releases each year would include one film based on an existing character and one featuring a new character, saying it's a nice rhythm in that format. While not always the case, as evident by the 2013 releases of Iron Man 3 and Thor The Dark World, he said it is certainly something to aim for. Feige expanded on this in July 2014, saying, I don't know that we'll keep to that model every year, but we're doing that in 2014 and 2015, so I think it would be fun to continue that sort of thing. In February 2014, Feige stated that Marvel Studios wants to mimic the rhythm that the comic books have developed, by having the characters appear in their own films and then come together, much like a big event or crossover series with Avengers films acting as big giant linchpins. After the reveal of multiple release dates for films through 2019 in July 2014, Feige stated, I think if you look at some of those dates that we've announced, we're going to three in a few of those years. Again, not because there's a number cruncher telling us to go to three, do more than two pictures a year, but because of the very reason just laid out. It's about managing existing franchises, film to film, and when we have a team ready to go, why tell them to go away for four years just because we don't have a slot? We'd rather find a way to keep that going. After the titles were revealed in October 2014, Feige said, The studio is firing on all cylinders right now, which made us comfortable for the first time to increase to three films a year in 2017 and 2018 instead of just two, without changing our methods. On expanding the characters in the universe and letting individual films breathe and work on their own, as opposed to having Avenger team-ups outside of Avenger films, Feige stated, it's about teaching the general movie-going audience about the notion of the characters existing separately, coming together for specific events and going away and existing separately in their own worlds again. Just like comic readers have been doing for decades and decades people sort of are accepting that there's just a time when they should be together, and there's a time when they're not. In April 2014, Feige revealed that Edgar Wright's pitch for Ant-Man in 2006 helped shape the early films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, saying, We changed, frankly, some of the MCU to accommodate this version of Ant-Man. Knowing what we wanted to do with Edgar and with Ant-Man going years and years back helped to dictate what we did with the roster for Avengers the first time. It was a bit of both in terms of his idea for the Ant-Man story influencing the birth of the MCU in the early films leading up to Avengers. In October 2014, Marvel held a press event to announce the titles of their Phase 3 films. The event, which drew comparisons to Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, was done because all the information was ready. As Feige explained, we wanted to do this at San Diego Comic Con this year. Things were not set, so the plan has been, since a few weeks before Comic-Con when we realized we weren't going to be able to do everything we wanted to do, is to decide, let's do either something we haven't done in a long time, or something we've never done, which is a singular event, just to announce what we have when it's ready. I thought that might be early August or mid-September. It ended up being at the end of October. By September 2015, after Marvel Studios was integrated into the Walt Disney Studios with Feige reporting to Walt Disney Studios chairman Alan Horn, instead of Marvel Entertainment CEO Isaac Perlmutter, the studio's creative committee had nominal input on the films moving forward, though they continued to consult on Marvel television productions, which remained under Perlmutter's control. All key film decisions going forward will be made by Feige, Desposito, and Victoria Alonso. At the end of the month, on how much story is developed for future films of the universe, Feige said there are broad strokes through sometimes super specific things, but for the most part in broad strokes that are broad enough and loose enough that, if through the development of four or five movies before we get to the culmination, we still have room to sway and to move and to go and to surprise ourselves in places that we end up. 
so that in all the movies, hopefully when they're finished, we'll feel like they're all interconnected and meant to be and planned far ahead, but really can live and breathe enough as individual movies to be satisfying each and of themselves. The studio also has various contingency plans for the direction of all their films. In the event they're unable to secure a certain type of actor to reprise a role, or reacquire the film rights to a character such as was done in February 2015 with Spider-Man. In April 2016, on moving the universe to Phase 4 and reflecting on the first three, Feige said, I think there will be a finality to moments of Phase 3, as well as new beginnings that will mark a different, a very different, a distinctly different chapter in what will someday be a complete first saga made up of three phases. Joe Russo added, you build things up and people enjoy the experiences you've built up, but then you kind of reach an apex or you reach a climax, a moment where you go, this structure is really going to start to be repetitious if we do this again, so what do we do now? So now, you deconstruct it. We're at the deconstruction phase with Captain America Civil War and leading into Avengers Infinity War, which are the culmination films. A year later, Feige felt that after the conclusion of Phase 3, Marvel might abandon grouping the films by phases, saying it might be a new thing. Feige also mentioned that Avengers Endgame would provide a definitive end to the films and storylines preceding it, with the franchise having two distinct periods, everything before Endgame and everything after. On the potential for superhero fatigue, Feige stated back in 2016, This year we've got Civil War and we've got Doctor Strange in November, two completely different movies. To me and to all of Marvel Studios, that's what keeps it going. As long as we're surprising people, as long as we're not falling into things becoming too similar, next year Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, Thor Ragnarok, those are three totally different movies. As long as the only shared thing is they come from the same source material and they've got our Marvel logo in front of the movies. Other than that, they can be very distinct. What other studios do, what other properties, nothing we can do about it. In December 2017, the Walt Disney Company agreed to acquire assets from 21st Century Fox, including 20th Century Fox for $52.4 billion. The following June, after a counter-offer from Comcast worth $65 billion, Disney increased this offer to $71.3 billion. The transaction officially closed on March 19, 2019. The acquisition would see the return of the film rights to Deadpool and the X-Men and Fantastic Four characters to Marvel Studios, which would create richer, more complex worlds of interrelated characters and stories. The MCU, just like Marvel Comics, went on to generate huge box office returns proving once and more all that superheroes can even eclipse their own beginnings by becoming staples in every facet of pop culture. Lee lived long enough to embrace and enjoy his success. In September 2012, Lee underwent an operation to insert a pacemaker, which required cancelling planned appearances at conventions. On July 6, 2017, his wife of 69 years, Joan, died of complications from a stroke. She was 95 years old. In April 2018, The Hollywood Reporter published a report that claimed Lee was a victim of elder abuse. The report asserted that among others, Kia Morgan, business manager of Lee and a memorabilia collector, had been isolating Lee from his trusted friends and associates following his wife's death to obtain access to Lee's wealth, estimated to amount to $50 million. In August 2018, Morgan was issued a restraining order to stay away from Lee, his daughter, or his associates for three years. The Los Angeles Superior Court charged Morgan in May 2019 with five counts of abuse for events in mid-2018. The charges are false imprisonment, grand theft of an elder or dependent adult, fraud, forgery, and a charge of elder abuse. Lee died on November 12, 2018, six weeks before his 96th birthday, at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, after being rushed there in a medical emergency earlier in the day. Earlier that year, Lee revealed to the public that he had been battling pneumonia and in February was rushed to the hospital for worsening conditions at around the same time. The immediate cause of death listed on his death certificate was cardiac arrest with respiratory failure and congestive heart failure as underlying causes. 
It also indicated that he suffered from aspiration pneumonia. His body was cremated, and his ashes were given to his daughter. Roy Thomas, who succeeded Lee as editor-in-chief at Marvel, had listed Lee two days prior to his death to discuss the upcoming book, The Stan Lee Story, and stated, I think he was ready to go, but he was still talking about doing more cameos. As long as he had the energy for it and didn't have to travel, Stan was always up to do some more cameos. He got a kick out of those more than anything else. Stan was a hero to the end, one who was always thinking of his fans whom he loved more than anything. His career is indeed something to marvel at. He's become a legend the likes of which we'll probably never see again. That is unless someone like you is out there with the same kinds of superpowers that Lee had at his disposal. Limitless imagination. Excelsior indeed. Wow! I'm smarter than ever! Uh, I think we're ready. What do you say, team? I say aye! Let's do this! Yeah, the super fan dogs are back! United and ready to fly! Uh, can we stop by the mess hall first and grab some snacks? Space Slobber, I thought you fed on knowledge and adventure. Sure I do, uh, but a few mutton chops don't hurt either. Can it wait till after our impending mission, Slob? Uh, all right, all right. Can I at least take a jerky chew on the galactic road? Ha <laughs> Slob, you goofball you. You four have done exceptionally well and are hereby ready to blast off to your next adventure. Woohoo! Wow. I'm gonna have to get a new cape just for the occasion. Thank you for the super fan knowledge brush up, Dr. Tailwag. We feel more ready than ever. Well, I can only get you so far, pups. The rest is up to you. Oh, we'll take it all the way, Doctor. Be it a forgotten comic strip, a lost superhero, or anything in between. The super fan dogs are here to save the day. What is it gonna be this time, Doctor? I'm glad you asked, Sky. Your next mission is. There go the super fan dogs, the most amazing canine team, embarking on their whole new adventure. Will they succeed? Will they return victorious? Space Slobber, Sky Fetcher, you and the rest of your super fan dogs completed your mission in record time. All right. <laughs> All in a day's work, Captain. Well, what a day it is! And it's only begun! Your new spaceship is tuned up and ready for blastoff! Eugenia and Toughnut are suited up and familiarizing themselves with the controls! Time for a whole new mission! We'll do our best out there, Captain Fuzzface. Yeah, missions are in our blood. I have complete faith in you and the rest of the team! You're the best and brightest heroes we've ever had the pleasure of calling four of our own. Thank you, sir. We won't let you down. I don't doubt it, Sky. Now, off to the launch pad with you two. The galaxy awaits. Here we go. Oh, um... Do you guys think we have time to drop by Space Steak on the way to our next assignment? Space Slobber! Oh, hey! They got the new mutton patty with cheese! I need to pick up my new cape! They just finished stitching the rhinestones on the collar. It's gonna be beautiful! Never mind the cape! We need to get to the lab! My three brains need a tune-up! <laughs> hold on to your tails, team! It's gonna be a long journey to parts unknown! and beyond. See, that's what I mean. Uh, maybe we ought to stop by Space Dick. <laughs> Space Slobber, you're a one of a kind. Ready, team? You bet your floppy ears were ready, Sky. Let's go. The Super Fan Dogs are back in action and on a new mission. <laughs> <laughs>